And welcome those of you who are here with us right now. Um, I often start the morning with uh, a little bit of gratitude and today I will share that um, just enjoying the view of this red maple tree outside my window. It seems to be a different shade of red every day. That's pretty special. Just feels like I'm drinking up these colors, knowing that they won't be here much longer. And uh, did a little wander down the street this morning and it was lovely to see some ducks in the creek <laughs> and some fall flowers still out. And uh, yeah, it's just a lovely time of the year to be feeling this transition. So I hope others are also enjoying it. Um, and I'm delighted to be continuing our uh, series of guest speakers um, today. As you've seen, um, we have Catherine Piggott joining us. And Catherine, I've uh, come to know over the last uh, probably 16 years or so, as I've become you know, connected with uh, local food systems work, um, including through the Food System Roundtable. So Catherine has over 25 years of experience addressing the social determinants of health. And if anyone is not familiar with that term, I would encourage you to um, ask her about it <laughs> at the end of her talk, if it doesn't come up during her talk with us today. Um, some of you may have taken the course with Leah Miniker in planning, and I'm sure that's been a big focus of, um, of that work too, but it hasn't actually come up in our conversation per se in this course, um, but, it's, but very relevant to food systems work. Um, and Catherine's expertise spans food security, local food systems, housing and homelessness, poverty reduction, crime prevention, integration of newcomers, and active transportation. And Catherine was a manager at the region of Waterloo Public Health with responsibilities for all aspects of its local food system planning from 2000 to 2020. Um, and she holds a graduate diploma in public administration with a specialization in local government from Western University. So I'm thinking that um, particularly the readings that we did last week and for today and earlier the public health reports that we were reviewing um, on food systems work um, are all kind of very familiar themes to Catherine. And so yeah, if you have questions that emerge from any of that, I um, hope that you can bring that to our discussion today too. Um, and I've learned, yeah, a lot from Catherine over the years. I think she's, a, she's really knowledgeable about uh, local policy and governance. And, um, and has really astute insights. And so I'm really delighted that she agreed to come and share some of those insights with us today. Um, so over to you, Catherine. Well, thanks so much, Stephanie. And uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here today. So um, I, I basically, in my own way, I'm going to begin with a story of gratitude and just share with you uh, a reflection on uh, the local food system, I guess. I'm, I'm a long distance cyclist and um, recovering from an injury. So over the summertime, I've been driving to Wallenstein, Ontario and going along uh, the Guelph to Goderidge rail trail um, as far as Milverton and then returning. And um, I'd strongly encourage all of you, if you've never done it, um, to go to Wallenstein and either walk or cycle along the rail trail because you're going to find yourself in the heart of uh, the region of Waterloo um, at the beginning, uh, agricultural land. And, uh, you know, it's really something to behold and it's really quite spectacular. And the rail trail cuts right through um, many of uh, many farms in the area. And I just think it gives you an idea of the, of the extent of, of uh, the farms in Waterloo region and, uh, and really what a treasure they are. I, uh, when I was cycling back from Milverton, um, just um, coming into Waterloo Region the other day, I bumped into um, older farmers, uh, both a, a man and a woman, and uh, they were um, old order Mennonites. And um, they were 
telling me about uh, the growing season this year, and uh, I had expressed concern about the amount of rain that we'd been having this year, and I asked them if that had affected the crops, and, and the, the farmer, who seemed to me to be about 85, told me that this was one of the best growing seasons ever in Waterloo Region, for him at least, and that um, he'd never had such a, a wonderful wheat crop. And uh, he also told me that they were gathering up um, excess hay and um, getting ready to ship it out to west, the west of Canada, where, um, as I understand it, there's been a terrible drought. And of course, for him and his wife, that was the thing that needed to be done. And I'm just struck by their sense of ger generosity and solidarity, if I can call it that, with their, with their farmers in the west of Canada. So then I left, well, I, I left the rail trail and ended up at the Wallenstein General Store. And there I, I purchased $55 worth of groceries and I bought local milk, local apples, local onions. I also bought um, some maple syrup and um, I also bought some local cheese. And the reason that I'm telling you this is I thought, wow, this is amazing. I went into the store and the, there was just this incredible availability of local food and um, and and it made me feel uh, quite encouraged. Um, oh, I forgot one thing. I also bought some local flour that was milled in Wallenstein and I was quite encouraged. I thought, wow, this is the local food economy in action. And so, um, but as I move into this talk with you, it does, I, I, I feel gratitude, but then, I mean, since then I've been to my local value mart, which is just a, uh, near the Frederick Street Mall here in Kitchener. And uh, I'm right back to experiencing what I'll call the globalized food economy where everything's from someplace else. And um, I could be buying exactly the same things in Thunder Bay or in Montreal, and there would be no uh, differentiation in terms of the food products available. I mean, that's, I'm probably being a bit strong, there would be limited um, uh, differentiation in the food products available. So um, giving thanks, as Stephanie began, uh, in terms of the amazing um, um, agricultural community here in Waterloo Region, but also, also thinking about the strides that have been made um, in terms of creating um, uh, a healthy local food system, but also really aware that in some ways we're, we're just at the beginning of things. So thank you for your, for your attention. And now I'm gonna move into, uh, I guess, a more uh, formalized presentation. Um, I know everybody's on uh, uh, mute at the moment, but please, if I'm, if I'm getting ahead of you or you don't understand anything, um, please, please just uh, give me a shout and, and I'll, I will stop immediately to offer clarification. And also bear with me because this is my first um, uh, presentation, I believe, in, in this kind of virtual learning environment, which and now I'm sure you're all very well accustomed to. So um, here goes. or here narrowly goes as I try to get my computer to cooperate. There we go. I just wanted to say that um, I've gone to that um, general store and I think it's great. Um, and I've been slowly shifting to buying more, like I bought my brown sugar there, like for my, um, cause I'm, I was typically buying my, my big bulk stuff like that from Costco, but if I can get it from there and the price is, it, you know, it's a reasonable price it, that it makes me happy to shop there. So I've been getting my yeast there since the beginning of the pandemic, because that was the only place you could get it when everybody was sold out. They, they didn't run out. <laughs> Thank you, David. There's a shout out for the Wallenstein uh, General Store. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to I'm going to begin. I, what I'm trying to do today is just really give a bit of an overview of my understanding. Um, of food systems planning in Waterloo Region. So I'm going to start um, in terms of a little bit of a description around food system in Waterloo Region prior to 2000. Catherine, we can't see your presentation. Oh, that's because I didn't set it up to share it with you. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, not... 
Yeah. Yeah. No need. Um, Just making okay. sure you didn't want to. <laughs> no. Okay. So, uh, pro I, I can send you the notes when I, um, when I've had a chance to footnote them and so on. I just really did it. I was thinking more of a storytelling approach. That, that works, great. So um, prior to 2000, um, there was a lot of activity in Waterloo Region regarding um, food and agriculture. There was of course a large agricultural sector, which was a combination of small and larger farms. There was a well-established emergency food sector with many strong institutional actors who in turn linked to smaller neighborhood and community centers. And some of those institutional actors were and continue to be the House of Friendship, the Food Bank of Waterloo Region and the Cambridge uh, Self-Help Food Bank. There were many community gardens sprinkled across the three cities of Kitchener, Cambridge and Waterloo. And the Community uh, Garden Council of Waterloo Region worked tirelessly to promote these gardens. Um, and to link uh, gardeners to resources so they could function uh, smoothly. Nutrition for Learning, which uh, had launched in 1997, was providing school nutrition programs in Waterloo Region. There was an um, organic production center, uh, sector in Waterloo Region um, with well-established private sector contributors such as Spending Organics. There was a thriving community nutrition worker program in which community-based uh, peer trained their community trained other community members on how to prepare healthy meals and with food safety in mind. There was uh, the, working uh, the working center, which uh, was running all kinds of uh, locally based um, food. So just to say um, is that um, there was a lot going on before food systems planning got going in a formal way in Waterloo Region. And so, we're, so uh, when folks got together to do that, they were building on many, many strengths. But in many ways, um, I always I always love this term um, that was used uh, that has been used by Rod McRae, who's an academic, I believe, at York University, and he talks about how food and and subsequently local food systems have been hidden in plain sight. Um, and in many ways, uh, food plays a tremendous role in our lives and our health um, in our communities. But uh, it's only recently that people are really beginning to understand uh, the significance of that role. So in early 2000, um, the uh, region of Waterloo uh, Public Health went through reorganization and something called the Health Determinants Planning and Evaluation Division uh, was formed. And it became the first public health unit uh, division in Ontario with a mandate to address the social determinants of health. So what are the social determinants of health? Um, I'm using here the Canadian Public Health Association definition. The social determinants of health are the social and economic factors that influ influence people's health. Um, and so those can be both positive and negative. So one social determinant of health is income and working conditions. So if you make a great uh, living and you have an interesting job and you have control over your work environment, that would mean that social determinant of health is really improving your quality of life. If you have a poor paying, tenuous job with poor working conditions, that social determinant of health is gonna be very much working against your quality of life. Region of Waterloo Public Health saw the creation of a healthy local food system as a way to promote the social determinants of health due to its potential to influence the physical well-being of residents, to improve the environment, to stimulate economic growth, to preserve the vitality of rural communities and to build a sense of social connection. Now, I, I was just actually thinking that this now seems quite obvious. At the time though, it was really, uh, um, we were sort of, uh, I think taking a chance by, by coming out with this, this statement. So the challenge uh, for the Health Determinants Planning and Evaluation Divi Division was to take a theory that suggested public health had a key role to play in advancing the social determinants of health at the local level and put it into action and achieve meaningful results. And all this work of the Health Determinants Planning and Evaluation Division was really grounded in the theory of health promotion. And health promotion is the process of enabling community residents and organizations to increase control over and improve the social, environmental, and economic determinants of health by working with them to identify the, the issues that are important to their health, broadly defined, and building capacity over time to address these issues. 
So the region of Waterloo Public Health was an initial catalyst in advancing health and community food systems work. However, over time, these efforts were complemented and strengthened by other regional government departments and other local governments, school boards, organizations and networks, such as the Waterloo Region Food Systems Roundtable. And so to go back to the whole idea of health promotion and capacity building, much of public health's work was to really um, work with community partners so they could embrace some of these food systems projects and initiatives and take them on. And the really wonderful thing about this is that many of these initiatives are ongoing and uh, they're so, um, so much part of the work of community partners now, they've completely forgotten about public health sort of initial catalyst role. So, um, it, so in some ways, um, it can be a little, what's the word, um, hard because in, in a way it's, it, it's something um, you put lots of work into. On another level, it's quite fabulous because, um, because it's owned and, and done by other people, um, it, it, it takes on a life of its own. So the health department, uh, sorry, the health determinants planning and evaluation division uh, reached out to community partners to see what issues were important to them and concerns were expressed about food security and the agricultural sector um, by many, many people in the region of Waterloo. Um, and this um, uh, led to the decision that the health determinants planning and evaluation division would focus on food systems issues so what did the healthy community food systems work look like? Well, from 2000 to 2005, um, there was really significant outreach to the agricultural community. And um, uh, we launched something called the Buy Local, Buy Fresh Map, which was a way of um, highlighting all the local um, farmers. And um, it was uh, an attempt to create um, farm gate sales. And we also worked to create and fund an organization called Food Link Waterloo Region because we were keen to have um, a nonprofit entity that could um, in its own way act um, as, as, the, as the organization that would link local farmers to local consumers. We also were really engaged in planning for the third National Food Security Assemble, Assembly, which took place here in Waterloo Region. And that in turn launched Food Secure Canada. That happened in late 2005. And there was also in a lot of work building relationships with our planning department colleagues at the region of Waterloo. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Yes, absolutely. That's my preference. Yeah. Um, so uh, you were earlier speaking about how you were reaching out and having school and other like institution connections. Um, you know, like with the other community connections, what was the like reception of that? Was it that there were people at the schools or other institutions that wanted to do this that were it took the initiative or was there policy or was there so, like, how did you get them to get involved? I guess that's my question. Was it that somebody else there was interested or did you have a bunch of workbooks or how did it go? Yeah. Well, I, I would I would say that there was no uh, generalized approach, um, and what I mean by that is, um, as a, there were many many relationships that were built, and in some instances, uh, folks were just keen from the onset and they jumped on board. Um, in other instances, uh, folks weren't that keen on the onset, and it was a a long process of uh, building relationships and. Uh, in some instances, um, it wasn't impossible to work with certain um, organizations or governments right away. And, um, and, and here, I guess we relied on a fundamental community development principle, which is go where there's energy to organize and move. And so in some instances, we would work with a really interested city um, and it would move ahead and do really innovative and wonderful things. And in that sense, that city would be a better uh, partner to go out and talk to other cities because other cities in some way some in some instances respond better to their peers so david to answer your question i wish there was a formula <laughs> but but there never was a formula formula i think it depends on 
the folks who happen to be working at certain organizations or institutions. Um, and, and I think also as you change the political and social cu culture over time, the, um, the readiness for, for many people um, is, is greater than it would be when you're just starting out. So it's complicated and it's contextual. Yeah, does, that, does that help? Yeah, no, it, it's definitely, it makes sense that it's easier to initiate this stuff where people are hungry for it um, versus, you know, language there, but, <laughs> um, but uh, so, but I think that it, it, like you said, it's about getting it to a scale where the peers or then the economics is easy to sell again to another municipality or another, because they're all just businesses. Uh, to sell to them on how the economics of this is different and beneficial. Um, and what I was read like from the readings this week, I was seeing it as like the ledger. If you can create a ledger of all of this economics, then it's easier to sell, but you kind of have to have it backed by someone who already did it. So that's why I was interested in how you got things started and it makes sense well, that- Well, well, that's that. great. Just give me one moment because you're talking about the economics and um, I'm gonna jump into that in one second, if that's okay. I really appreciate your, your comment. So I'm really skipping ahead here. Um, and there was a publication of a report in 2005 and the authors were Mark Schwerb and Ellen Desjardins and it was called, called Towards a Healthy Community Food System in Waterloo Region. And this, I've been asked to comment on stakeholder involvement and this report was vetted and guided by an advisory committee of local food stakeholders. And it drew on extensive local research that had been carried out or commissioned by Region of Waterloo Public Health from 2000 to 2005. And that research, um, uh, it, was, it was really extensive and it, it spanned the local food economy, local food marketing, rural health and food access, diet quality and health status. And going to the local food economy, um, there was something called the Region of Waterloo Food Flow Analysis. Um, there was a fresh approach to food, which looked at local food buying in Waterloo Region. There was a food mile study, but there was also something called Growing Food and the Economy Study. And this, um, this was a 2003 release, and it was really helpful in terms of building buy-in, um, from my perspective, with key decision makers at the region of Waterloo. And I'm, unfortunately, I don't have the study in front of me, but at, at a global level, growing food in the economy really um, emphasized the importance of the agricultural sector to the local economy. Um, the job numbers were, were large, um, and it was really, really, and, and to some degree, so at the time, and there was just such a strong emphasis on high tech in the region of Waterloo, and of course, of course, there still is because it's so important to our economy, but growing food in the economy study was really, really important because it, in dollars and cents, really pointed out that agriculture was super important to the local economy in the region of Waterloo. And, and, and from my perspective and my, remem my memory, it was like a a turning point for uh, getting lots of key decision, key decision makers on board. Um, and so I'm just gonna, we also did a rural health study, which uh, um, talked about the level of stress amongst low, uh, um, amongst sm small farmers and um, really received a call from them to, to, help, um, to help them to sort of consolidate their, um, uh, to it first to protect their farms, but also to help them in terms of their their incomes. We we also looked at food access, which was you know some issues around, um, you know how how our, our community was planned and organized and where um, food was available and where it wasn't and how um, and how that could be um, important uh, for people who um, who aren't close to um, a supermarket or what have you. And we also looked at diet quality and health status. Um, one of the reports was a, a glance at diet, weight, and diabetes, but I will also, I think you were asked to read this, um, I really do think from that pool of research, the optimum nutrition environment in the model region, which was um, uh, written by Ellen Desjardins and Rod McRae, is a really important piece of work because it really talks about how we'd actually need to retool what we grow to ensure that um, we had enough healthy food for the population. So using that, um, uh, as a background, um, 
piece, it, the, the Towards a Healthy Community Food System report presented an overall goal. And the goal um, was that all residents have access to and, and can afford to buy safe, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food that has been produced in an environmentally sustainable way and that sustains our rural communities. And the report had seven object objectives to ensure that all residents can afford to buy the food they need to sustain health, to preserve and protect Waterloo Region's agricultural lands, to strengthen food-related knowledge and skills among consumers, to increase the availability of healthy foods so that healthy choices are easier to make, to increase the viability of farms that sell food to local markets in order to preserve rural communities and culture, to strengthen the local food economy and to forge dynamic partnerships to implement the plan. I know that's a lot of information. From there, going back to the focus on stakeholder engagement, um, we did launch a stakeholder engagement process in the spring of 2006. There were 11 focus groups with over 80 participants who reviewed the interim report and its seven objectives and made suggestions for changes. And at the time, the focus groups included a technical advisory group, land use planners, there were two groups of them, restaurants, institutional purchasers, interested individuals, two groups, producers, old order Mennonite producers, manufacturers and distribution, food retailers. All focus group participants then met as a group in June of 2006 to vet final objectives and actions. So then this led to the endorsement by that group of, of, um, of, the, of, a, um, uh, of the Towards a Healthy Community Food Systems Plan with the added recommendation that public health continue to provide administrative and research support to the Waterloo Region Food Systems Roundtable. So what was the role of the Waterloo Region um, Food Systems Roundtable? At its inception, the Waterloo Region Food System Roundtable was a networking and policy advocacy group working um, that worked to build a strong voice for a healthy food system in Waterloo Region. And there, were, there was quite a lot of thought into representation at the time. There were 18 representatives from key sectors of interest in the local food system. And those representatives included local farmers, emergency food providers, food processing, food distribution and retail, and health professionals. And the roundtable, because it was away from government, it was sort of a, an independent entity um, of community volunteers, was able to advocate for important policy changes because um, it was free to do so. Um, and, and I think that I, it really played a very, but this, I mean, I'm, this is my, my bias opinion. I thought that it really paid, played a valuable role in terms of bringing forward food advocacy issues in the region of Waterloo. So a little later on, um, the roundtable worked hard uh, to um, go forward to develop a local food charter. And it did, um, it did again, stakeholder outreach uh, to achieve this end. And it sought endorsement um, of a local food charter from um, uh, regional council. And unfortunately, I don't have the date. I can find the local food charter, but I can't see its date. But I, I would suggest it's worth comparing the local food charter uh, with the initial um, uh, objectives of the uh, Towards a Healthy Food System Plan, because I'm seeing how within a number of years, things had already changed. Uh, the local food charter is talking about social justice and puts a stronger emphasis on ecological viability. And, um, and it also um, talks about the need for a, a, a food systems planning and a food system strategy in Waterloo Region. And um, it goes on, it, I mean, the food, the food ch uh, charter has sort of five components. And I would say the first three, uh, connecting people to a local food system, community economic development and access to healthy food, are, compare nicely, or there, there's a really good um, overlay with the initial objectives of the Towards a Healthy Community Food System Plan. But the second two components, which talk about support ecolo supporting ecological health, and um, also then talking about integrated food policies at all levels of government, government, I would say that's a significant leap from the um, initial Towards a Healthy um, Food 
systems plan. And um, the learning for me when I look back at this all is that you can just see how, um, how at, at, from my perspective, at the beginning when the healthy community system plan came out, it was really quite work. But then we're already seeing a number of years later, a group of folks led by the round table are saying, hey, that's not enough. We really need to think more comprehensively about ecological health and about creating integrated food policies at all levels of government. So I'm just now, I'm gonna just give you a really brief overview of some of the successes in terms of the creation of a local healthy food systems plan in Waterloo region. Um, there is a report, if you have, have the chance, I, I don't know if, if this was shared as a reading, it's called um, the Health of the Waterloo Root, Health of Waterloo uh, Food System, an update in May 2013. And it really provides uh, an update on food systems development up until that point. It was written by Mark Schwerb and it's, it's a really good background document. Um, but uh, a less, a less um, what's the word, comprehensive approach is just my list that I'm going to share with you now. Um, so there was like just, there's such a body of research and evaluation um, that was done uh, to a large degree by Region of Waterloo Public Health, but also by other actors, including Stephanie, who's right here, because uh, she began to ask her students to take part in, um, uh, to take part in, in sort of research efforts and to do specific uh, evaluations and research studies on, on specific food systems issues. So over the years, there was a real significant uh, body of, uh, of research and evaluation related to um, Food, system, uh, food systems issues in, in Waterloo region and linking to what was going on elsewhere. Um, there was also quite a lot of work around policy development. Um, and, and first and foremost, I would, I, I, and I believe you've read an article on this, was the development of the supportive agricultural and food access provisions with the regional official plan. Um, and then their implementation at the local municipal level. Um, and the region of Waterloo planning department was one of the first municipalities in Ontario to ensure food access provisions were integrated into uh, the development of a regional official plan. And it also features in, in, featured innovative policies to protect agricultural lands, but also ensure the viability of local farms through complementary on farm economic activities. And it also contained urban food access provisions that led to supportive food access policies in the three urban municipalities in Waterloo region. So um, there's policy development, but there's also policy implementation. And over the years, there was some policy implementation. Um, I, I would like to share ever so briefly the story of the Preston Heights water tower. We were approached by a community member at the Preston Heights community group. And um, she had read the regional official plan, which speaks to making regional lands where available. Um, of avail uh, where available, um, uh, making, uh, sorry, it speaks to making regional lands available where possible for um, urban, urban agriculture, community gardening. And she said, would, would she, they be able to buy the Preston Heights water tower site when it was decommissioned? And so this led to a very lengthy process um, that was uh, cross-departmental in nature. And in the end, um, the, Preston Heights water tower decommissioned land was, sell, was sold for a dollar. It was sold actually, I believe, to the Cambridge Colonies um, because we um, sort of did a deal. The, the planning department um, saw an opportunity to build some um, uh, rent, uh, sorry, um, uh, some, some additional housing that would be geared to income. So we ended up, I think, with 12 units of geared to income housing and an accessible garden on the site. Um, and in many ways that was because we were able to, or I should say the community groups were able to gain access to this parcel of land for $1, which all goes back to the draw. Um, there was also a lot of policy advocacy that happened over the years. Um, pu um, public health did the nutritious food basket costing on an annual basis. And then we uh, created a formula to look at how the cost of food related to other costs such as housing and electricity and et cetera. And we use that as a tool to advocate to um, our regional council. So it in turn could encourage um, 
uh, regional uh, council to advocate to the province to improve income support mechanisms. I think though, uh, in terms of policy advocacy, the, the jewel in the crown, so to speak, um, was the Food Spaces Vibrant Places campaign. And this was um, something that was spearheaded by the Food Systems Roundtable. And um, it was a digital campaign. It took place um, through a website and through Facebook. Um, or I should say it was partially a digital campaign because those were really important platforms, but also members of the Food Systems Roundtable met individually with everybody who was running for office. And the purpose of the Food Spaces Vibrant Places campaign was to encourage those who were running for municipal office to be aware of the benefits of community gardens and um, neighborhood markets. And um, it was, an, I, I really think it was, uh, you know, impressive. Um, the Re region of Waterloo Public Health helped out by um, submitting a funding proposal to the Heart and Stroke Foundation, which um, uh, uh, resulted in a grant of $20,000, which was sort of used to fund the project. And um, I mean, the results were, I believe, like uh, uh, um, the Bar Barry Verbanovic, who was actually running for mayor at the time, um, in, in to the best of my knowledge, and I would have to go back and verify this, endorse the Food Spaces Vibrant Places uh, platform. And, and here it becomes a little bit more tenuous in terms of following the link, but uh, the city of Kitchener did go on to create a community garden policy, um, which offered land funding, insurance coverage and staff resources to existing and planned community gardens in the city of Kitchener. And this freed up substantial public health staff time and resources. So, um, I must say, I would really love to go back and take a look at this uh, Food Spaces Vibrant Places uh, campaign and sort of uh, think and write about it a bit more, of course, in association with others, because I think it was really quite innovative. Hats off to the round table on that one. Um, so we also created organizations and structures to link local farmers to local consumers. I mentioned Food Link Waterloo Region, and it went on to sponsor the Buy Local, Buy Fresh map on an annual basis. It also helped develop the Amara Produce Auction, which in turn became another uh, structure that linked local farmers to local consumers because there's a, a regular auction now where you can buy um, local farm products. Uh, although it's not so much consumers who go there, it's more restaurants and others. And um, to go back to the ROP, um, the ROP um, changed provisions to actually make the um, Elmira, Elmira produce auction sort of uh, permissible under the land use um, planning uh, um, provisions in, in some of the townships. Um, there was a lot of work done around community-based initiatives to create access to healthy foods. There was a neighborhood market pilot project. Um, we strengthened community nutrition work program. There was a diggable communities collaborative, which over time received funding for community capacity building projects and accessible garden pilot project and a newcomer outreach project, um, which was sponsored in partnership with the council for agencies serving South Asians. The, um, I believe you had Seeds of Diversity come to talk to you, and yes. it is now spearheading the, the school garden project, but I was just pointing out prior to that, um, Region of Waterloo Public Health received funding from the Ontario Healthy Communities Partnership and the Ontario Healthy Kids Community Challenge to do research um, and create these pilot projects, and we reached out to Seeds of Diversity to do the pilot projects, and um, so it was sort of a stepping stone to a more um, uh, permanent um, school food gardens project. Um, and then there was the Woolwich Healthy Communities Coalition, um, and they sponsored an annual event um, to link local um, farmers to local consumers called the Taste of Woolwich. And uh, at its heyday, five or 600 people were attending that. So now I'm gonna ask about next steps for food system planning in Waterloo Region. And here I don't have the answers. I can just help pose questions. So in May, 2018, Region of Waterloo Public Health stepped away from providing research and administrative support to the Food Systems Roundtable due to a change in its mandate. So the Food Systems Roundtable continues to act as a food systems networking body. 
and Stephanie, I need you to step in and correct me if I'm wrong. It is a volunteer entity now and doesn't have the benefit of staff resources. And I was actually wondering, um, you know, in terms of the, um, uh, its prior engagement in the policy formulation process, I know the region of Waterloo official plan is now under revision for the time frame between 2021 and 2051. And I was wondering if the Food Systems Roundtable had been able to comment on that. We've been having some email discussion about that and considering reaching out to hold the line and Waterloo um, Federation of Agriculture, but no, we have not made a comment yet. Okay, and that's no way a, no way a criticism, but I'm just, I just was, was wondering, you know, what's going on. Um, so, so we still have the Food Systems Roundtable, but I'm just going to suggest that it's, it, there's such a broad mandate in food system planning that I would imagine that it's challenging to carry out all the things that need to be done on a purely volunteer basis. There's also a really changing context in terms of food systems planning. Um, it, food systems planning was new and innovative in 2000, and I would say it's now gained wide acceptance. Um, I think it's worth taking a look at the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact in, of October 2015. Um, it makes a compelling rationale that city level governments take on a strategic leadership role in, and I'm quoting here, in developing sustainable food systems and promoting healthy diets. And because while every city is different, they are all centers of economic, political, and cultural innovation and manage vast public resources, infrastructure, inf investments, and expertise. And the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact presents a suite of recommendations um, regarding food systems governance, sustainable diets and nutrition, social and economic equity, food production, food supply and distribution, and food waste. And, and I really thought that it was comprehensive in its approach. And, and I, I'm certainly going to go back to it and use it as, as a guide for um, some of my next steps in terms of thinking about food systems work. Um, I think, though, also, we're certainly in a different place now um, in terms of uh, um, recognizing um, the, and, 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 and uh, recognizing and promoting Indigenous food sovereignty. Um, I understand there's an Indigenous food sovereignty collection uh, collective in Waterloo Region, which acts at a grassroots, at a grassroots collective working to restore the land and creating community. Uh, and it says one times one, one times one. And that's, as I understand it, as on their website, as they, as they re re regain access to land, like one centimeter times one centimeter, one kilometer, one times one kilometer, um, indigenous food um, sovereignty will increase. There are also significant indigenous food sovereignty initiatives underway in Thunder Bay and in Northern Ontario. And, and that would be a whole other, I mean, I, I, I would be fascinated. I'm just point, pointing out that, um, you know, this, this is um, a new and growing development and I'd be utterly fascinated to grow about, uh, to learn more. But we certainly know in the region of Waterloo that um, there's so much to be done in terms of uh, uh, reconciliation. Um, with with uh, our with indigenous folks and indigenous re uh, residents, so I guess it's more a question: How would future food systems planning link to that? What what are the mechanisms? Who leads? What what how does this? How would this affect new governance structures? All I can do is ask these questions, um, and I also think that um, there's there's been quite a, a call for greater inclusion of racialized communities in food systems planning. And, and um, I noted that uh, the city of Toronto uh, approved Canada's first black food sovereignty plan um, just at the end of September or the beginning of October. Um, and it's specifically to respond to the need for immediate and comprehensive action to address the problems of food insecurity experienced by many black Torontonians. And um, I mean, there is a city of uh, Toronto report, but as I see it, the, the, the rationale and, and for, for this uh, uh, black food sovereignty um, plan, and I should say there's 
significant funding uh, behind it is that there are high food insecurity rates uh, amongst um, um, Black um, Torontonians um, and with 36.6% of Black children living in food insecure households. And um, the report also said that populations most affected by food insecurity have been identified as being most vulnerable to COVID-19, putting Black populations at greater risk of contracting the virus. So I, I, would, I would say, going back to 2000, there really was no um, specific thought to food security and racialized, uh, um, racialized groups in Waterloo Region. So that would be certainly something um, it's certainly something that that we may um, that would need to be considered um, in further food systems planning. Um, and again, I apologize that this has already happened. I I I I don't I am not I'm not in the loop in that regard at this particular juncture. So um, I'm just going to suggest that in order to truly shift diets, um, we'll have to shift the food system. And broadly speaking, it's difficult for individual choices to outweigh the wide, the wide availability of unhealthy food in our society. Of course, there are always exceptions to this rule and you may be one of them. Um, so um, I, I, I think just to, to finish, um, I'd like to introduce you to one of my all time favorite concepts in local government. I, I do a drum roll, but I, don't have a drum set and I doubt I would be a gifted drummer either. Um, I wouldn't be, the, uh, um, I, I'm not, um, and yeah, I wouldn't be uh, Charlie Watts of food systems drumming. But in any case, I, I think it's really important um, and, and helpful to think of the whole concept of network governance. And it's the whole idea that, um, you know, we're really in a new world. Um, we're facing increasingly complex and ever-changing social, economic, environmental, political, and technological um, challenges um, at a local government level. That's both local governments and communities. And um, so if we're really going to solve those problems together, we have to really think about forms of governance. And network governance is one of those. Uh, network governance, broadly speaking, are mechanisms to convene various partners together who transcend tra traditional boundaries. Um, so that means you're working with members of government, members of the private sector, civil society, um, and, and representatives of different services, education, health, housing, policing, et cetera. And you're all coming together and um, trying to, um, you know, develop a mechanism for decision making, um, so these issues can be effectively addressed. Network governance can take part; it can take can be sponsored from a local government, um, and in essence, um, I, I think to some degree it may be happening through the. Uh, the Crime Prevention Council of Waterloo Region because it's uh, sponsored by regional government, but has, um, uh, so there's, there's staff who work for regional government, but there are about 40 members of the Crime Prevention Council. And it's, it's, uh, it's up to that government bo governance body to come up with suggestions about how uh, crime might be prevented in Waterloo Region. Um, but it doesn't have to be led by government. It can also be led by funded agencies or nonprofits. But from my perspective, it's really an important um, development. Um, and I think it would be worth um, taking a look at in terms of next steps of comprehensive food systems planning in Waterloo Region. So I'm gonna stop there and ask if there are any questions or clar any clarifications and uh, um, I thank you very much for your time and attention. That was an amazing overview, Catherine, if I do say so myself. And I, I know that this recording is going to be an amazing resource um, for, in particular, for the members of the Food System Roundtable and associates in addition to this class and, and other members of the public. So I'm so delighted that you could put that, you know, long story together of 20 years of food systems work. Thank you. Um, and over to Ben for a question. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so in some of our readings uh, over the past week, we were kind of noticing how the role of public health has been a great proponent in terms of like 
making partnerships between groups and like getting involved in food systems compared to other areas, but also how it's been a barrier for, I guess, some like independently owned businesses to kind of make on the fly decisions that are based in like sustainable research and stuff, but don't necessarily meet the, I guess, like traditional safety requirements of the food service industry, um, but still, but while they're still able to make like a really effective business model. And so I was just wondering like, what were your thoughts on kind of the role of public health as being like, I guess like an agent of change, but also kind of like um, in some aspects of it, like inhibiting um, some, I guess, independently owned places from making decisions. Wow, that, that's a uh, really, um, you may not realize it, but I think you're really, um, honing in on, on one of the, um, I, I'll call it the inherent contradiction of public health. Public health is uh, sort of has a dual mandate. Uh, part of public health is, uh, it's about health protection. And, and public health in Ontario is guided by the Health Protection and Promotion Act. So in the Health Protection Act, and this is not my area, never was, there, there's a whole mandate around food safety and it's taken enormously seriously. And um, it's not only public health, they're also at a provincial and federal level, as I understand it, um, significant um, uh, guidelines related to food safety and handling and, and the production of food. And as I understand it, um, the larger, uh, or it used to be this way, the larger um, a business is, the easier it is in some ways to respond to the, the myriad of regulations. I mean, on the other hand, uh, public health has a health promotion role, which is really some of the things that I've been describing, bringing people together so they can deal with uh, issues that are really important to them. And it's all about facilitation and capacity building. And so you're asking, how, how, do, these two, um, how do these two sort of um, notions work together? Because on one level, you're, I, I mean, I saw this or heard of this in my work. There were small businesses that had great ideas around food, local food um, um, processing, but they weren't quite able to meet the, the public health um, safety provisions. So um, my answer to your question is, I really don't know how that, how, how, that, um, how that dynamic can be constructively resolved. And I think though it, it's, a compelling, it's a compelling question and that's just the kind of thing that you want to have a forum um, to discuss to discuss on an ongoing basis, and I, I really feel bad because I'm not giving you a succinct answer because all I can all I can do is sort of present to you the the wider aspects of the challenge. Thank you. Yeah, we were kind of trying to like figure out like because like health, I guess like the way it's being like I don't know. I guess like the way it's like defined in different areas and like what's trying to be protected versus like I guess what we know in like research and what would be I guess like objectively best versus like subjectively like political in terms of creating health policies and trying to let people do different stuff it's kind of a tough <clears throat> challenge and the other thing though I mean like you really always I mean there would be nothing more effective in um in in how can I put it um, when you think about local food and you think about local food marketing there would be nothing um, I mean we we first of all first of all you always have to be concerned about human health and safety and the you know the threat of E. coli and salmonella and all those sorts of things it's real and it it continues so I mean there's a there's a real reason for food safety provisions um, I I just I don't know, so, so I would never want anyone to think they're not important. I think, I think the issue is, I, you know, in terms of bringing people together and finding ways that they can have access to facilities that will allow them to process food in a, in a way that meets food safety provisions is, is, is an ongoing challenge. Thanks, Catherine. And just one thing I want to, I guess, to add, does that kind of like come from a place of like having a food system that is as large scale as it is now? Like, are those kinds of, I guess, like health protection acts kind of there because of the scale of the food system or would like the same 
like I guess if it was like on a smaller scale thing, would there be like the same regulations? Because I guess like maybe is there more like inherent risk to like contamination and having like a large scale kind of like project, or is it like kind of generally safer when things are done? Like, um, oh, well, I'm I'm really talking outside of my area of knowledge at this juncture, but you know. To you know, I, I think that it's it's false to suggest that if something's produced locally, it's going to be inherently more safe. I mean, you know, if you're dealing with, um, I mean, again, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I almost feel I need to step back, but I, I, I mean, I know that there are problems with, you know, we're seeing recalls in terms of lettuce, um, um, and I believe recently onions. Um, uh, I. I think the onions, there was something to do with salmonella. Obviously, those, some of those onions were produced and shipped from far away. Um, but I, I'm not sure. You, you know what? I'm going to have to say, I think it would be really a good topic to, to have discussed in, in, uh, in a wider forum. But like, I, I really don't feel comfortable. I don't, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I'm going to just say that. That's okay. <laughs> well, we might we might be able to say that you know the problems are different. Um, if when we have these like massive globalized systems of like California shipping lettuce like all over the continent and beyond, right. um, you know, from very large um, farms and plants and so on, um, then if there's a problem there, it's the scale of that problem is just massive because there's millions of consumers of those products, right? Whereas if we're talking about a little tiny operation that's making sausages or canning goods or something like that i mean they may have different types of food safety problems um they may still yeah have those risks um but the scale of impact would be quite different so yeah i think they're just two different things and so the problem that i think we've been hearing through the roundtable from people like um, mark reeser at waterloo federation of agriculture is that um, it's the problem of imposing the food safety regulations that exist for large scale operations onto small scale operations rather than adapting um, the regulations to the context of smaller operators. Um, and so that's what has created lots of problems of people having to go out of business because they can't afford you know, $200,000 worth of you know, upgrades to right. you know, have a commercial kitchen or so on. So that's some of the, some of what we've been hearing. So you should have answered the question, Stephanie. So I, <laughs> so there you go. Well, that's, a, that's, 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 that's a good, good answer. Thank you for that. And we should get Teresa Schumela's one day because she would have much more to say as well. Yeah. yeah and, and I mean, I, I, that would be wonderful because I, I really don't have on the ground experience around the food uh, safety portfolio. So I think that was really um, illuminating. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, you've complimented it so well by giving us all this really rich picture of all this other work, um, the food um, of public health, promoting food security and social determinants of health. So way to go. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I wanted to comment on uh, that like yes it's important for like a lot of what we've been discussing and what you presented is very uh local concerns but as we've learned and understood like we live in a seasonal climate and we do have to rely partially on imported foods especially for culturally um compassionate diets and those sorts of things the things that can't be grown here or out of season um and i was wondering like what could be done as far as changing import standards so that not only are the food systems that are here directly but those and you know it would be great to get everybody's diet to shift to you know what we can eat more locally and seasonally but in that transition we're still going to be relying on imported foods so yeah what can we do to make those imports more sustainable from where they're grown or what choices can we do on our end in order to have some control on that part of the aspect in this local economy? Well, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't think it's, again, I, I don't have the report in front of me, but I mean, I, I think there was a time, and I think it could have been the 70s or the 80s when 
Ontario was producing a lot more of its fruits and vegetables, which is only a component of, of the food supply. Um, so I, 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 think, I think the answer is, um, you know, if we want more, if we want more local food, it's not just uh, the production of fruits and vegetables and the purchasing of those, but it's processing um, those those local foods so they can be um, consumed outside of the growing season. And you know, again, I mean, in the course of my time at the region, I I what I heard around food processing was in terms of large scale food processing, I mean, I'm thinking Niagara region, as I understand it, the one canning plant closed. And so the very tool that would allow us to reach those, um, those goals of relocalizing the food economy um, actually closed in Niagara region. So I think it does come down to, it's not enough just to, lo uh, to grow local food, um, but we need to have mechanisms to process it. Um, and distribute it. And there are a broad, there are broad range of challenges in that regard. Um, although um, there are certainly many, many sort of uh, wonderful, I'll call them micro examples of how that's happening successfully. So I, I almost, I almost feel that, you know, again, this is, um, you know, certainly as we look at, you know, I'm, I am very aware of the, um, the climate change talks that are taking place in, in, in Glasgow. And I, I do really wonder about, um, you know, how, um, you know, how food fits into all that. And, um, you know, in many ways, it really, the, the whole food process, the need to, uh, to process food locally, or, or even in Ontario, it doesn't have to happen to be in Waterloo Region. I mean, it's part of a, you know, an economic development strategy. And uh, I mean, and that economic development strategy, of course, always relies on um, people, consumers, of, you know, willingness to buy these products. And, and that may mean people spending a bit more money. I don't know if that's economic, if, if we're at that moment that people are ready to make that economic sacrifice for the social good that it would provide. Do you have any ideas about how we could do this? Oh, I was hoping with your readings, you'd be able to, okay, there you go. No, just more like the idea, I guess, the one thing that came to a, a thought for me was taxing or those sorts of things on goods that were, like if there is local options or Ontario options, then maybe if we were to be taxing or imposing a financial uh, stress on imported goods, then it might make it easier. Like one thing I was just thinking about, I saw an article about how well, like in your grocery store, there's all these tomato sauces and things, and they're using child labor in order to process them somewhere else. And you might just be buying them unknowingly. So if, because we have no idea of that supply chain, maybe we should be just taxing it more until it becomes apparent that the supply chain is an environmentally, you know, or sustainable process because, yeah, we can't grow fruit and I don't want to eat canned peaches all winter. So, you know, like maybe getting those imported things and making sure that they're coming and but then at the same time, I think it's contradictory because if you're thinking things should be culturally and um, socially, you know, equality and access, then if I'm my culture relies on a lot of imported foods or certain my diet is, you know, geared that way, then I'm already being penalized just because of where I come from and my dietary choices of my you know, my culture rather than just my choices. Um, right. So I, the taxing goes both ways. So I find it, it's like a difficult balance. So I, I'm not exactly sure. I think it comes down to education and maybe maybe on the alternative, then it's subsidizing um, uh, the local stuff for, you know, a period of time, sort of like a transition in order to make it like, well, this is really way more economical and better for the environment. And if I can make these options way cheaper, then these ones will just get ignored and they'll be diverted and export or that company somewhere else will have to do something different with their products. Right. Yeah. It's, those are wonderful observations. I, I, um, I also really appreciate your comments around uh, what's cu culturally appropriate and, and how that makes the uh, decision-making lens wider and, and more complex. 
in an already very complex scenario. So. Catherine, just uh, picking up on some of those points, I don't know whether you remember the details. Um, um, it's going back a few years, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, say um, local procurement. So mm -hmm. let's say the region of Waterloo in the little cafeterias that they have in, in various government office buildings, you know, wants to boost the proportion of local food that it's serving. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of, what were some of the barriers, um, you know, and even with the CETA, like the, the, um, the uh, economic trade agreement that was going on with, mm -hmm. with Europe and how that was potentially going to be, you know, um, flat, you know, prohibiting or inhibiting rather the, these opportunities for, for local food procurement. That was kind of one piece of my question. I don't know how much you recall about kind of those details. Yeah, and, and you know, Stephanie, I don't, I don't quite remember what, I mean, I know there was uh, concern about the, um, the Canadian trade agreement with Europe and how it might uh, impede municipalities to make those uh, food procurement um, decisions, but I'd honestly have to go back and look at it. I think the other challenge that was at play is that, um, you know, many many local governments and institutions sign long-term contracts with um, major um, food distributors. I mean, Sodexo, I believe it's one of them. So, um, so it becomes incumbent then to uh, either, either find a local provider who can provide you with everything you need in terms of uh, signing a contract or uh, to encourage the large uh, food um, suppliers to um, carry much more, much more local food. And again, this is, I'm sort of getting, um, I'm getting sort of excited about this because I don't know, I don't, again, I don't know what happened there. That was the barrier that was at play. I mean, I, I can honestly say, I mean, just to go back to, um, um, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, I, I, that I had a, a that I had an injury, and I did spend some time in hospital last year, and I hadn't noticed a grand improvement in terms of the um, uh, hospital food. It seemed to me quite prepackaged, and <laughs> and you know what I mean, just just bought in um, large quantities and uh, um, and served to those of us who were you know found ourselves there, and there was no greater motivation than to remove myself from that environment <laughs> so so again that that I I, I I would I'd happily look it up but I don't have your answer Stephanie yeah yeah are there any, are there any other questions I can't answer <laughs> in, in your amazing um kind of historical trajectory of of uh, food system change and initiatives um, there was one more that I thought was quite significant that you may want to comment on and that was in 2009 the um what did we call it? A food summit that happened at the right. Victoria Park Pavilion, like 175 participants, a lot of them having, you know, lived experience of food insecurity and poverty. Um, do you want to kind of bring that piece into the into your story at all? Um, yeah, I believe each year there's a international. Um, I, I, for, I, I don't have the, the proper name there. There's a, you know, an, an international um, uh, day that looks at the issue of food security and and we and the food is world, world food day yeah it's world, October 16th world, yeah world food day and um and so yeah it was it was it I think it, I'm not sure if this was uh with if this was exclusively sponsored by region of Waterloo Public Health or it came out of the food systems roundtable and and you know on, on one level I think the confusion is great because we work so closely together that you know what I mean? The boundaries were not that formal. And that can be a good thing because it shows that there was just a high level of trust. But in, in essence, it was, uh, um, yeah, there was a Waterloo Region Food Summit. And uh, as Stephanie said, over 170 people came. And it was a great, it was a great opportunity to do a check in about what was happening on the ground and get rich information and direction from a wide range of community partners about how we should continue to um, direct our activities around food security. And uh, yeah, I mean, and just, you know, you know, just uh, um, the energy and the commitment in the room was, was, was enough to sustain 
us all through another round of, of challenges. It was, it was really quite the day. Amazing, David? Uh, something just came to me and I was thinking about it from a planning perspective um, that what if we were able to designate any food retail location as a food service in the sense that, you know how grocery stores have other grocery stores flyers in front of them? Like mm -hmm. when you go in there, cause then they're like, well, you can do your price shopping. You understand you're buying food and you can go wherever you want to get it. Mm -hmm. Now I've always wondered why don't food boxes and these other food sources, why aren't they advertising? Or what if this, the region gave them the opportunity to advertise at these major food retail outlets that serve the majority of the public? and open their eyes to the idea of getting a food box or a farm box or being part of a CSA or all those different, like these, there's more food options. And I feel like education is a barrier, but most of us go to the grocery store and then commercial capitalism blinds us, but the city has some ability to step in there and provide some education because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a public need. It's not, uh, it, there's nothing superfluous about food. We need it. So right, right. if we were able to use it or designate it as a service, then it could be more seen as these are food networks or food mm -hmm. network uh, uh, hubs or however you were to relabel them. And then that way we can connect each other to better food. Well, I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a wonderful idea. Like, I think, I, I think that I like the terminology as food is a human right. Um, and, uh, you know, we all have a right to healthy food. Um, I, I think that it would, you know, again, um, I'm not sure what if anything has happened over the last uh, nearly two years, but I, I really think that, um, Advertising some of these alternative options would be a, a wonderful idea. I'm not sure if, if that's happening anywhere. If it is, I, I, I don't know of it. But at this juncture, just because I don't know about something doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, but I, yeah, I think that, um, um, you know, again, I mean, think ultimately uh, food systems change is about changing, um, uh, you know, public culture and attitudes. and um, but above and beyond that, you need to ch you need to sort of change the whole the, the sort of the whole infrastructure. So it makes us, it, you know, if our attitudes and our and and our our attitude towards food changes, and we want to do things differently, the next step is that we need to have options open to us that are easy and we can fit into our daily lives. And and I think what you're suggesting fits that quite well. I would add, yes, so it's an intriguing uh, proposition, David. Um, I would add that, so currently my understanding, especially in COVID times, is that the CSAs were like sold out within minutes or days um, right. and because there was so much demand for local food with people, you know, interested in um, kind of protecting, <laughs> protecting themselves and sourcing locally and just uh, being concerned about what global supply supply chain implications and disruptions might have on on their own food security um so i think i guess that would be one one obstacle to you know uh to advertising these things more widely but on the flip side um you know i've heard from teresa schumelas and other um people connected with the you know organic uh, and farming community here and said that we have so much capacity in this community to produce more local food if there were more demand um, mm -hmm. And so that's a good point to heed when people kind of think, oh, we don't really have much capacity. We're already, you know, running out of agricultural land and converting it to uh, to urban sprawl and so on. Um, but she has a very different picture. And we're going to read a report that she was part of um, in two weeks time and exploration about local and organic food systems in Perth, Waterloo, Wellington. So, oh, I, I, that sounds great. I'd like to use that report. And, and I think what you're saying, Stephanie, is that, um, yeah, I, th I think that um, in terms of any, you know, local economic issue, you can often run into, you know, su supply and demand quandaries, so to speak. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that 
um, the supply of locally grown food is probably limited right now in Waterloo Region because of, of, of the, uh, the uptick in interest because of COVID-19. Um, but if, you know, it's, it's a great question. If, if that demand is sustained and can grow, then that means there would be capacity to provide more food and thus localize the food system more. I'm kind of thinking that the grocery store too would be seeing it as, okay, well, if everybody really wants that local stuff, well, maybe I should be stocking it. Um, and then their business is then being purchased more locally and those sorts of things is that it would increase their desire to grab that market if they find out that there is a market for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm recalling too, David, a few years ago when in Uptown Waterloo at the town square there, they started a, um, a market, I think it was like on Wednesday or Thursday afternoons, and they had a number of local vendors there, but I think there was a lot of tension with Value Mart, you know, being concerned about, you know, I mean, a few farm stands there, is that really going to have any impact right, right, right. on their business, you know, because in a more enlightened perspective is that people can go there and buy some, you know, tomatoes and squash and corn or whatever, and, uh, you know, and then stop in at Value Mart to buy some dried goods or milk or whatever else, because of all kinds of things that they can't buy at the little farmer's market there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some limitations in how we approach these things. The grocery stores don't seem to be concerned about being a block away from each other. I don't see why they would be concerned about a small piece of competition in their parking lot. We have a long way to go. But anyway, that's been a really, um, yeah, insightful conversation. And I really appreciate uh, the questions that people have contributed. And, and Catherine, all of your sharing about uh, 20 years of perspective on, on this work. Um, it's been so inspiring. So I uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, I mean, again, I can't see anyone at the moment. But um, yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for, for teaching this course. And, and thanks to everybody who's enrolled in it, because I really do think uh, uh, food systems um, is is just uh, you know it you know, going back to Glasgow and the climate change discussions. Uh, food is really important for a healthy future in so many ways. So I'm delighted that so many of you have signed up and um, are are going through this wonderful learning process together.